So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome Bruce Riddell, who's going to talk to us this afternoon about Afghanistan and Pakistan, the implications of the breakdown in the peace process with the Taliban. Uh, Bruce is a senior fellow and director of the Brookings Intelligence Project, part of the Brookings Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence. In addition, he serves as a senior fellow in the Center for Middle East Policy. He retired in 2006 after 30 years of service at the Central Intelligence Agency, including postings overseas. He was a senior advisor on South Asia and the Middle East to the last four presidents of the United States in the staff of the National Security Council at the White House. He was also Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Near East and South Asia at the Pentagon and a senior advisor at the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in Brussels. He's also an author, having written many books on a variety of topics on the Middle East. He was a member of President Bill Clinton's peace process team and negotiated at Camp David and other Arab-Israeli summits, and he organized Clinton's trip to India in 2000. In January 2009, President Barack Obama asked him to chair a review of American policy towards Afghanistan and Pakistan, the results of which the president announced in a speech on March 27th in 2009. In 2011, he served as an expert advisor to the prosecution at Al-Qaeda terrorist Omar Farouk Abdul Muttalib in Detroit. So Bruce is eminently well qualified to speak on, this, on the Institute on Afghanistan and Pakistan this afternoon. And his breadth of experience in, his, in the very heart of US decision making over many years will surely create for a fascinating session this afternoon. So Bruce, thank you very much. We're delighted that you can join us and we very much look forward to hearing what you have to say. And I'll hand over to Roddy now. Bruce, it's great, it's great to see you and thank you so much for joining us. And uh, Doug, thanks for that uh, introduction. Uh, I wonder if we could start off, I guess, with the fundamental question, Bruce, of uh, the deal signed by the US and the Taliban. Uh, what's in it? and what is not? And are the Taliban living up to their commitments? Could you start us off with that? That'd be great. Certainly. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. And uh, it's particularly a pleasure to be uh, with my, my good friend, Roddy Gao, uh, on this opportunity. Uh, the deal that the United States and the Taliban signed at the end of February is a very flawed deal. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a recognition of the legitimacy of the Taliban. Uh, they get equal pay, equal um, treatment with the United States of America. Uh, this is for an organization that even when it controlled Afghanistan back before 9-11 was recognized by only three governments in the world, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. And now it's been given equivalence with the United States of America. The deal calls upon the United States to remove all of its forces in Afghanistan within 14 months. And it's very explicit. In fact, it goes into almost mind-numbing detail about who has to go. Contractors, security personnel, diplomats. Uh, in, in essence, what it means is that anyone who's involved in the fight against terrorists, including CIA personnel, has to be removed from Afghanistan by 14 months. On the other hand, it calls upon the Taliban to ensure that its soil, the soil it controls in Afghanistan is not used to launch attacks against the United States and its allies. Um, it doesn't say they have to break with those groups. It doesn't say Al Qaeda or uh, groups like Lashkar-e Taiba uh, need to be removed from Afghanistan. It just says that they cannot be using the territory of Afghanistan to launch attacks against uh, the United States and its allies. That's the essential deal. Complete American and, by implication, NATO withdrawal from Afghanistan in return for a promise that Afghanistan will not be used for attacks like the 9-11 or the Madrid bombings or the London bombings. It's also interesting what's not in the, in the treaty, uh, in the agreement. Uh, first of all, uh, NATO is not 
in the agreement. There's not even a mention of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, it's there by implication. More importantly, the government of Afghanistan, the government that we have been supporting for the last 19 years, and which has international legitimacy, is recognized by the United Nations, occupies a seat in the United Nations, was not a party to the deal. In fact, it's almost certain that there would be no deal if the government of Afghanistan was included. The deal does call for the government of Afghanistan and the Taliban to engage in negotiations to create some kind of future government. Uh, it doesn't give any details on that. And last but not least, there's no ceasefire in the agreement. There's vague talk about reductions in violence. Um, some of the language here is so convoluted that it's very hard to figure out what they were trying to get at, let alone what the standpoints would be. But it looks like what the Taliban agreed to is stop attacking Americans, but not stopping to attack other targets like the government of Afghanistan, the Afghan army. In practice, uh, the violence has continued. It's had ups and downs. We had a short ceasefire for the end of Ramadan. Uh, uh, that was a good piece of news, uh, but it hasn't led to an overall cessation in violence. Let me turn to the question, the second question you asked, which is, is the Taliban complying with the deal? And here we have the results of the United Nations monitoring team. Uh, when all the resolutions were set up on Afghanistan, 19 years ago. One of them was that the UN would get periodic reports from a team of expert advisors on various subjects. In the most recent report, the UN concluded that relations between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda are as strong as ever today. And as an intelligence officer, I'm always looking for what are the specifics that they can point to? What details do they have? And the report is remarkably detailed. It says they have evidence acquired from their own information and from member states' information of six high-level meetings between Taliban leaders and Al-Qaeda leaders, one of which included Ayman al-Zawahiri, Osama bin Laden's heir, uh, one of the most wanted people in the world, uh, met specifically with the Taliban leadership, presumably somewhere in Pakistan. He doesn't travel to Afghanistan. He stays in Pakistan. It also says that there are hundreds of Al-Qaeda fighters embedded with the Taliban in Afghanistan, supporting their operations and working along with them, somewhere close to a thousand in all. It notes that other terrorist groups, like Lashkar-e-Taiba, the group that attacked Mumbai in 2008, are also deeply embedded uh, in uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan and are working to carry out operations there but also to train for operations against other targets around the world. In short, it paints a picture of Afghan uh, Taliban Al-Qaeda ties uh, that are not going away, that are not being disrupted anyway, but which are today quite firm and quite strong. Now, since technically that's not a violation of the agreement, because after all, I said the agreement says you just can't use the territory, um, they can't we can't say they are uh, violating the specific terms of the agreement, but they're certainly violating the spirit of the agreement, which was that the United States would leave Afghanistan in return for the Taliban, ensuring that Al-Qaeda and other extremist groups no longer operated in their territory, either in Afghanistan or across the border in Pakistan. Bruce, th thank you for, for setting that scene. Um, I wonder if we could just turn our attention now to Pakistan. Pakistan, where I think many of us, um, certainly past cricketers, were rather pleased that Imran Khan got in as prime minister, concerned about the amount of money that China is pouring into Pakistan, which is now greater than the support coming from the United States. And it seems that Pakistan is, from what you said, much more than just a sort of passive player here. What is going on in Pakistan with regards to Afghanistan? Uh, Imran Khan has uh, performed better than most expected. Uh, he's been a, uh, uh, something of uh, good news. Uh, his, his reputation as a politician before this was a man who uh, indulged in, in not just conspiracy theories, but in bizarre conspiracy theories. In office, he's actually done a much more competent job. 
On Afghanistan, the Pakistanis have a long-standing policy of supporting the Taliban. The Taliban headquarters is in, Af is in Pakistan in Kieta. It's referred to as the Kieta Shora. The uh, Pakistanis provide a sanctuary for Afghan fighters. Uh, they provide safe havens for the leadership. They assist in raising money uh, for the Taliban. Uh, and there's good evidence that Pakistani intelligence officers actually accompany the Taliban on missions inside Afghanistan. That's a long-standing policy. It goes back to Pervez Musharraf. Um, Imran Khan hasn't changed that. What Imran Khan has done is show much more interest in negotiations with the United States and with the government of Afghanistan in trying to find a political solution uh, to the problem of Afghanistan. Uh, Imran Khan has been in regular contact uh, with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who's the driving force behind the uh, Taliban agreement in the United States. Uh, he's also ensured that the Chief of Army Staff, uh, General Bajwe, who is very important, uh, has been engaged in this process. Now, at the end of the day, the Pakistanis want a Taliban victory in Afghanistan. But they'd also settle for a political settlement in which the Taliban has an important say, but may not control uh, the entire apparatus of government. We don't know yet. We haven't seen that. The place where Imran Khan has been undone, unfortunately, has been the coronavirus, which has hit Pakistan very, very hard, and which the government has found very, very difficult to deal with uh, because the Islamic establishment in Pakistan won't countenance a lockdown. Uh, not, even a, not even a temporary lockdown on the mosques, which means that you have large gatherings of Pakistani uh, civilians inside um, with no social distancing, which is a prescription for disaster. And that's what's now happening in Pakistan. It's facing one of the worst coronavirus uh, infections in the world in a country of 200 million people. Is that also affecting uh, Afghanistan, the coronavirus? Yes, it is. <clears throat> um, it's harder to get good information on that. Um, data on things going on in Afghanistan uh, is hard to come by. Uh, we get good data when there's a spectacular terrorist attack, uh, like the terrorist attack on a, a mosque, uh, I'm sorry, on a hospital a few weeks ago. Uh, yeah. Data on more mundane matters like the economy and the virus are hard to come by but it's clear afghanistan like pakistan like iran uh, is being hit very hard by the pandemic right could is this has the feel of becoming rather like a sort of a proxy war with china standing behind it um i was intrigued in one of the things you've written that in fact there's, there are there are uh, quite a lot of uyghurs in pakistan and yet in China itself, we see what's going on with the treatment of the Uyghurs there. Um, what is the influence of China in all of this? China has enormous influence. Um, Pakistan is, is almost certainly China's closest uh, ally, partner, um, client, whatever you want to call it. Uh, China has invested tens of billions of dollars uh, in building infrastructure, uh, linking China uh, through Pakistan uh, to the Arabian Sea. Uh, it's building a large port uh, on the uh, uh, Arabian Sea uh, shoreline of Pakistan at Gwadar, uh, will be one of the largest ports in the entire region. In short, it's trying to find a way to um, get to the Persian Gulf without having to go through the Straits of Hormuz and through the Indian Ocean, having a direct line, all of which makes perfect strategic sense uh, for China, uh, and all of which is um, good for the Pakistani economy. But it also reflects the fact that what we have here is a competition between China and India on the one hand, India and Pakistan on the other, and China and Pakistan finding themselves de facto partners. Uh, this has been going on for decades. It goes back to the early 1960s. Um, and it understandably uh, makes India feel uh, endangered uh, and encircled. 
Uh, and it worries <coughs> countries like the United States, like the United Kingdom, that China may get far too much influence in Pakistan. And, and uh, Bruce, you've worked with many different administrations um, and at your time at Brookings. Um, this has a feel too, does it, of, a, of yet another failure of US foreign policy, which doesn't seem to have been particularly effective in recent years. The um, Afghanistan-Pakistan problem has now bedeviled uh, every president since Bill Clinton. Um, the rise of the Taliban after the uh, fall of the Marxist government in Afghanistan uh, has been a problem for us now going back uh, to almost 25 years. Uh, we've tried everything, more troops, uh, pressure on Pakistan, uh, financial inducements to Pakistan, uh, sanctions on Pakistan. Uh, the only thing that has really worked, and I think this is very ironic, uh, is the approach that Barack Obama used against Al-Qaeda. Uh, Al-Qaeda today, while it still has a presence in Afghanistan and Pakistan, is a hollow shell compared to what it was in 2008. Um, when Osama bin Laden was alive, living in the town where Pakistan has its military academy, the equivalent of Sandhurst uh, for uh, Pakistan. Uh, the commando operation that killed Osama bin Laden, and even more importantly, the drone strikes against Al-Qaeda individuals gravely weakened the organization. Uh, in fact, we wouldn't be talking about a deal with the Taliban today if not for the effect of those strikes back in the Obama administration. Now, you're not going to hear, you're not going to hear Donald Trump or Mike Pompeo thank Barack Obama for making this deal possible, um, given the uh, polarity and uh, polarization in American politics today. But that is indeed the case. But it doesn't resolve the problem we're talking about here, which is what to do with the Taliban. Uh, whether we like it or not, we are in war with the Taliban, and by proxy, that means we're at war with the Taliban's sponsor, Pakistan. Uh, and we haven't found a solution to that. Um, this deal, uh, in the eyes of many, amounts to a unilateral um, surrender uh, to the government of Pakistan and the Taliban. And I think a $64 million question, as we talk about this today, is. Will Trump just pull out all the American troops by election day or maybe by inauguration day? Even if he doesn't, and Joe Biden is elected president, Joe Biden will have a basically two months to make a decision about whether to pull out, according to the timetable in the deal, or to stay uh, on indefinitely. That's a very tough decision to have to make with very little time in a new presidency. Thank you, Bruce. I'm going to turn over to uh, Doug Cook now. Could you just comment on um, perhaps India and, and their involvement in a bit more detail? And particularly, it seems how um, they've, uh, Afghanistan has been sort of pulled into the Kashmiri question and also um, the role of Iran. Right. <clears throat> as well. uh, India is a very strong supporter of the Kabul government. Uh, it sees a natural relationship between uh, India uh, and Afghanistan. Both feel threatened by Pakistan. Um, it's important to note uh, that Pakistan, the fifth largest country in the world in terms of population, is a country that doesn't have demarcated accepted borders on two fronts. One is the Kashmir front, where there is only the line of control, uh, basically a ceasefire line left over from 1948. And then secondly, the Afghan-Pakistan border which was drawn by the British Empire uh, during the Raj, and no Afghan government has ever accepted it. Um, even the Taliban, when they were in power, allegedly Pakistan's client refused to accept uh, what is known as the Durand Line. So India sees a natural partnership uh, with the government in Afghanistan. It provides uh, money to it. Uh, it has helped build its parliament. Uh, it tries to improve economic ties, and it also sees in Afghanistan a path to Iran, uh, a, a means of being able to 
uh, build a relationship with another one of Pakistan's uh, bordering countries, or the Iranians. And in more particular, uh, India has been engaged in helping to build a road and a railroad that would link landlocked Afghanistan to the Arabian Sea and the Gulf of Oman through Iranian territory. Again, this, this makes perfect economic sense. Uh, Afghanistan should have alternatives uh, to getting its goods to market other than through Karachi. Um, but all of these things, the uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor, the India-Iran-Afghanistan outlet to the sea, all of these things naturally press the buttons of the opponent's paranoia and give them the sense that they're being surrounded and isolated. Um, so what makes excellent economics sense also contributes to the sense, tension, and fear in the region. Uh, and, and that's not a new development. We've been living with this for 20, 25 years now, uh, but it's a perennially dangerous environment. And arguably the US NATO military presence in Afghanistan has helped to provide something of a stabilizing factor over the years. The people knew that um, in addition to what we did vis-a-vis -vis Al Qaeda and the Taliban, we were also there to ensure uh, that the nation states uh, might engage in subversion against each other, but do not engage in all out war. And it's an open question, what happens if all the American and NATO forces leave? Will that stabilizing factor um, fail to, uh, be there anymore and therefore uh, we could see these things boil out of control. I, su I suppose uh, if the Americans were to leave and, and obviously in view of the, the, the however the peace deal uh, manifests itself, um, it's, it really depends on the sort of capability and the capacity of, of, Afghan, of Afghanistan's defense forces and its institutions to deliver the rule of law, governance, security, et cetera. I mean, is that something that you have confidence in? It's an unknown, really. Um, we've spent 19 years trying to build an Afghan army, an Afghan police force, uh, an Afghan air force. Uh, we've, we've had progress. Um, some units of the Afghan army, uh, particularly their special forces commandos, are really quite good. Um, the Afghan Air Force, which we neglected for the longest period of time, we're now finally putting the resources in. You know, it's, it's really ironic that uh, in fighting a counterinsurgency, uh, which the United States has spent a lot of time doing uh, in my lifetime, uh, we've learned that air power is absolutely crucial. And yet for the first 15 years of supporting the Afghan government, we neglected to give it any kind of air power at all. It had to go begging to the Ukraine to get Russian in order to just move its commanders around. That's finally changing. Here's my guess. If we leave, the government will hold on to Kabul and most of the other major cities in the country. Not just because the government has sufficient military power, but because the citizens of the major cities uh, don't want to go back to Taliban rule. They remember what the Taliban rule was like. It was a medieval hell, uh, particularly for Afghan women. Uh, and there are sufficient number of Afghans who don't want to have that happen. But I think in a lot of rural areas, uh, particularly in the South, uh, you'll see that the, um, the Taliban uh, exercises more and more control. So the civil war uh, that's been going on now since the Russians left back in 1989 will just keep going on maybe a little less intensely and without American air power, uh, but I think it'll go on for a long time to come. It's when I hear the Afghanistan um, sort of authorities talking about their military capabilities, they, they seem to be stressing at the moment how successful they're becoming and, and how proficient they're becoming. Um, and, and I just wonder what your view is about the real capabilities of the Taliban. And, and clearly, 
they're sort of augmented, supported by Pakistan and, and Al Qaeda, as you've mentioned. But but I, I just wonder how much of a threat the Taliban really are compared to perhaps some of the sort of transnational criminal group activity, the corruption, and and, and some of the other interference that's arising from from other neighbours. Um, I just wonder what your thoughts are on on the Taliban's capability. Right, a, a disturbing. Uh, indicator of Taliban capabilities is that they have now on more than one occasion uh, briefly taken over Afghan uh, cities including some uh, in the north which we would have thought was not really uh, friendly territory uh, for the Afghan Taliban. Now in all of these cases um, the cities are retaken fairly quickly by the combination of Afghan National Army uh, backed up by uh, NATO and U.S. Uh, air power. So they can't hold them. But the very fact that they can overrun them is something that they couldn't do five years ago, and certainly not 10 years ago. The big weakness the Afghan, uh, there are enormous weaknesses the government of Afghanistan has, not the least of which it seems incapable of holding a free and fair election and announcing results of the election. Um, we've had now uh, three Afghan presidential elections in a row uh, in which the outcome, uh, to put it mildly, is very fishy. Um, in the last two elections, uh, we've had to come up with power sharing formulas after the fact uh, to accommodate uh, the two leading contenders, uh, President Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah. Um, that's one indication of troubles. Of course, you mentioned the narcotics problem. Uh, which has never been under control and is now more out of control than ever before. Uh, criminalization, uh, you also have a problem of, of local uh, militia leaders who essentially don't listen to what happens in, in Kabul. Um, the most uh, interesting example of this is uh, uh, General Dostam, uh, who rules uh, the uh, Uzbek part of Afghanistan in north central uh, Afghanistan. Uh, General Dostam was a leading figure in the Marxist government uh, and one of the most capable uh, commanders uh, supporting the Soviet forces uh, back in the 1980s. He's probably the single best Afghan communist leader. When the Russians left in 1989, he continued to support the Marxists for a couple of years and then all of a sudden discovered uh, Islam, capitalism, and uh, market forces and became a complete con convert, theoretically, to all of those things. Uh, the Taliban essentially put him into exile. We brought him back uh, after 2001. Uh, he was Ghani's vice president in the last administration, where he essentially uh, ignored everything that Ghani was doing. Uh, he runs his part of Afghanistan, a Sherbagan province, as more or less an independent state. Um, I've been there, and it's very striking. Uh, despite his conversion to Islam and capitalism, he runs the state like it was a part of the former Soviet Union. The kids in school, for example, all wear little uniforms. Uh, they carry signs that you know, look like they're left over from the Soviet Union. Um, his his Marxist Leninist uh, roots uh, in how to govern uh, still come through very clearly. He's also very brutal. Uh, he's been accused of all kinds of war crimes. Without question, he's guilty of many of them. Uh, it's an example of a state that is in many ways dysfunctional. But at the same time, I would. I wouldn't caution people to remember, uh, this is the best state that Afghanistan has seen uh, since the monarchy was overthrown back in the 1970s. Uh, there is freedom of uh, religion. Uh, Shias have a much better place in Afghan society. And most importantly, women have a much better place in Afghan society. They can go to school and they do by the millions. Uh, they can go to hospitals. Um, Afghan women, if we want to look, if we want to point to one accomplishment, 
since American and NATO forces went into Afghanistan 19 years ago. It's the role of women in Afghanistan. It's something to be proud of and something which would very much be endangered if the Taliban came back. Thank you. Women's empowerment in the way that you've described is, is, is obviously a great success. Afghanistan needs institutions and you need the, the areas that you've just been describing. But I, I just wondered what it's like on the ground in some of these areas in terms of the ability for people to set up businesses and, and to, to, to grow and develop commerce, uh, commerce activity. Yes, Afghan women uh, need to have institutions put in place that are going to guarantee their rights over the long term. Um, it's interesting to note that while Pakistan is the patron of the Afghan Taliban, it certainly doesn't treat its women uh, in um, uh, Pakistan anywhere near the way Afghan Taliban women are treated. I mean, Pakistan, after all, is a country that's had a female prime minister. Uh, Pakistan uh, can play a role in pushing the Afghan Taliban um, towards a, a, a better posture uh, towards uh, dealing with women in the future. At this stage, uh, rhetoric makes one very worried. They continue to talk about Islam being the sole uh, governing principle for the government uh, and hearkening back to the days of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. We'll say one other thing that's, I think, quite interesting about Afghan women, uh, and that's uh, the place that Afghan women hold in the American public's mind about Afghanistan. Uh, the widespread perception uh, in elite circles in the United States is that the war in Afghanistan is very unpopular, that it is seen as, quote, an endless war. Um, certainly, President Trump talks about it in that way. This is an endless war and nothing has been gained. At Brookings, we've done a lot of polling on American attitudes about Afghanistan, and we find something strikingly different. Um, a majority of Americans, a significant majority, well over 60%, support continuing to have troops in Afghanistan uh, indefinitely. We don't feel that this is a big drain on the United States. And a significant majority of the American people are very proud of what we've done in Afghanistan for Afghan women in particular, and believe it would be morally wrong for the United States to leave Afghanistan and betray Afghan women. Now, I find this polling quite uh, interesting uh, and to a certain degree quite uplifting because it suggests that the American public uh, has a, a, a better attitude about Afghanistan than most of American politicians do about Afghanistan. Bruce, thank you. Um, I have a question from John Dels. Uh, John, if you'd like to ask your question. Bruce, thank you very much for a really marvelous talk. Um, what are the major factors in the rural support for the Taliban? And uh, in your estimation, what could be done to change that? Thank you. That's a, a very good question. Um, the Taliban enjoy rural support, mostly in Pashtun areas. In fact, the, the Afghan Taliban really could be referred to as a Pashtun Taliban. Uh, they've never been very successful in recruiting recruits uh, in uh, non-Pashtun areas, in the Tajik areas, uh, in the Uzbek areas, and certainly not at all uh, in the Shia areas in the center of the country. Um, there are some uh, Tajik uh, Afghan Taliban, but not many. Uh, there's virtually no Hazari Sia uh, Afghan Taliban. It's very much a um, ethnic driven uh, <coughs> movement seeking to maintain Pashtun dominance. Uh, Pashtuns are a plurality, they're not a majority of the country, uh, and they've run the country for the last several hundred years, one way or another. It's also clear that the Afghan Taliban uh, gets support simply from the fact that uh, Afghan tribes do not like to have strong central government rule. Um, they're not used to strong central government rule. Uh, they don't 
have any sense of loyalty uh, to Kabul. They have loyalty to their tribe. Uh, and the Afghan Taliban have been very good over the years at encouraging that kind of behavior. Um, and then finally, there are parts of the, the Afghan Taliban movement which are essentially leftovers from the Mujahideen War back in the 1980s. And the, the most important of these is the Haqqani Network. The Haqqani Network was created uh, in the 1980s uh, by the Pakistani Intelligence Service uh, with money from the United States and Saudi Arabia. Um, it was probably the most lethal of all the Afghan Mujahideen movements. Um, it has morphed over the years, and it is today uh, the most powerful faction in the Afghan Taliban, and the one that is most, lo most closely aligned, ironically, with both Pakistan and Al-Qaeda. Um, and it is usually the one responsible for the most horrific uh, terrorist attacks that are carried out in Kabul. Chris, thank you. Peter, please, yeah, if you ask your question. Okay, thank you very much indeed for your talk. I found it fascinating. I talked in the past about Afghanistan to a former chief of the defense staff who was the commander of NATO in Afghanistan and who pointed out that in the United Kingdom we spent something like 550 billion pounds on that war, but you in America spent almost a trillion pounds on that war in America. And he had a solution to it all, because he would like to really pay off all the warlords that were there in Afghanistan. And he knew it all. And he said that would only cost a billion. And uh, it would really save an awful lot of money. What are your views on that kind of very practical solution, sir? Thank you. Uh, as, a, as a practical matter, we do pay the warlords <laughs> a lot of money. Um, uh, and we've been doing this for a long, long time. Uh, the government in Kabul, uh, to the extent that it has support of people like uh, General Dostam, who I mentioned earlier, uh, has it because basically the United States behind the scenes is paying Dostam uh, to support the government. Um, the uh, various warlords are expensive, um, and the more they get money, uh, the more they want, uh, none of which could come as a surprise to anyone uh, who's ever engaged in trying to uh, uh, buy support. Uh, the one part that won't work is the Taliban. Uh, they're not interested in our money. Uh, the Taliban are genuinely committed to their cause. Um, and while we don't agree with it, uh, it's easy to understand their cause. They are, uh, in addition to being Pashtun nationalists, they're also Afghan nationalists, and they want to drive all foreign forces out of the country. Um, that's why they fought the Soviets in the 1980s, and that's why they have resisted us uh, ever since uh, 2001. Uh, and that's, I should have mentioned this area earlier, a core element of their appeal uh, to Afghans, particularly Pashtuns, that they are a nationalist movement fighting foreign forces. And that's why their overwhelming desire, and it's, and it's reflected in the deal uh, that we signed with them back in February, it's all about getting the foreign forces out of Afghanistan. And by foreign forces, they mean literally everybody, not just the military, but police. Um, covert operatives, uh, chartered groups, uh, everybody is going to be thrown out. Uh, I think they would also demand that any government in Afghanistan get rid of any Indian military advisors that were there, uh, any Iranian uh, military advisors. Um, they are not susceptible to being bought off, uh, which is why in the end, uh, although it's a clever idea, uh, I don't think it'll work. Bruce, thank you. Joe, are you there? So my question is, is in the event that US NATO forces pull out, is there a potential for a larger Indian presence to prop up the 
the Jaroa? And if so, could you see an event where India may target or combat the Taliban um, either covertly or overtly? Sir. It's, it's certainly a possibility. Um, ever since the disastrous Indian uh, intervention in Sri Lanka, uh, Indian governments have generally avoided uh, putting troops um, outside of the, of the country. I, I could make a case that we're in a different environment today. Um, what has restrained India from significant number of troops to Afghanistan over the last 20 years um, is really the United States and NATO. Uh, we did not want to turn this into an Indo-Pac uh, proxy war. Uh, we only, we, we've always thought that that would only complicate the situation. It probably would complicate the situation. But if we're leaving, the government of Afghanistan is going to be looking for help from anywhere it can get it. Uh, and India uh, will, be a, will be a likely place to look. And we have, a, we have a much different government in India under Prime Minister Modi uh, than we've ever had before. This is a far more nationalistic, uh, far more chauvinistic uh, government than we've seen before. Uh, Prime Minister Modi has shown he's willing to bomb targets inside Pakistan. Uh, we now also, in the last 40, 24 hours, have the first fatalities of an India-Chinese clash uh, on their border uh, in Kashmir. Uh, three Indian soldiers are dead today. We don't know exactly why, but that's the first time uh, soldiers, either Indian or Chinese soldiers, have died on the border uh, since 1975. Uh, so that's, that's alarming. The details of what's going on there are very complicated at this stage, but it is an indication uh, that we have a very nationalist government in India. We also have a very nationalist government in China. Um, so tensions there. I could definitely see <coughs> India uh, determining that its interests require intervention in Afghanistan after American forces pull out. Uh, and that would make a complicated, messy situation uh, even more dangerous than it is today. Um, we just have one more question from April. Oh, hello, Bruce. Great hello. To Hi Great there. Great to see you. Thank you. Wonderful to see you and wonderful to hear the latest news on Afghanistan, um, however disturbing it is. Um, last November, I was at NATO headquarters for an event and at a dinner sat next to the Depu Deputy Secretary General, um, who was the former Romanian foreign minister, I think. And at that time, he said, um, he said, the Americans are coming out. He said, but we will stay as long as it takes. And I thought that was a really interesting declaration. And I just mm -hmm. wondered if you could talk a bit about NATO's presence there. Uh, I noticed um, when we were taken through on a tour of NATO headquarters, there was prominently a, uh, a display of um, ISAF on one of the floors and in fact there was a, a turquoise mountain um beautiful um jolly uh, carving um you know sort of a doorway and um and the isaf flag was next to it and there was a um you know canada um had had paid for that uh, to be at nato headquarters so i think there's still very strong support among our allies I think you're, you're right. Um, uh, operation in Afghanistan is NATO's first really out of area operation. Um, you know, this, is, this is clearly not Europe by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> and the various NATO partners uh, have all put in a considerable amount of effort. Um, you know, when, when NATO started going in, uh, each NATO country uh, selected a province uh, in which it would be in charge of uh, reconstruction and, and help with governments. Um, the, uh, the French uh, 
smartly picked uh, the, uh, the valley uh, where uh, the Tajiks live, uh, knowing that there would be no Afghan Taliban to fight. Uh, the Canadians picked uh, Kandahar province, which was the worst place to pick in the country. Um, as the British found out later on when they increasingly began involved in Helmand and Kandahar themselves. Uh, the Lithuanians picked a province in the middle of the center of the country, uh, which is completely snowbound for four months of the year. You can't get there. You, there is no way there. Uh, but the Lithuanians took that on. Um, I think many of these countries have, have performed admirably uh, and would like to continue to live up to their responsibilities. The question I would ask any NATO partner though is how are you going to do this without American forces enabling you, uh, providing transport, air transport to come in and to bring supplies in? It would be a lot more difficult uh, for most NATO partners to do this without the United States there to help them and particularly without the United States Air Force to help resupply them. But I think this goes back to the, to the point I made about American polling too. The notion that everybody in the West uh, is fed up with this war and wants out is just not borne out by polling and the facts. Uh, yes, some countries have pulled out. Canada has left its troops out. But many have other continued to have a presence. And even in the Canadian case, Canada continues to be involved in reconstruction activities. I don't think that the public by and large uh, in the NATO countries has given up on this war as much as the politicians in some of these countries, particularly in the United States. Thank you. Bruce, thank you. Um, I'm just going to find, get one final question from David Harrison. Um, David, if you'd like to ask your question and then I'll pass over to Roddy. Bruce, thanks very much for your fascinating insights. One, one um, perspective that perhaps we haven't touched on is, is that of Russia. Um, and obviously they've had a long involvement uh, historically in Afghanistan. Um, and I think it's always been reckoned that they want a stable situation. Do you have any um, uh, insights into what the Moscow perspective is on this um, deal that's being put together? Uh, the Russians do very much want a stable situation. Uh, they have no interest in seeing an Afghan Taliban takeover. It would only lead to uh, Taliban support <coughs> for dissident groups uh, in Chechnya and other Muslim parts of the uh, Russian Federation. It would also be a threat to uh, the Central Asian uh, countries which uh, remain aligned with Russia uh, and which would very much feel threatened by uh, an Islamic Afghan Taliban takeover in Kabul. It's not clear what the Russians are prepared to do um, in order to prevent that. I think one thing is clear, they don't wanna go back, they don't wanna send troops back into Afghanistan. I've been there, done that, and had a very bad outcome from the Russian standpoint. And I have to say over the last 20 years or so, uh, there's been, more than a little bit of gloating, and I told you so, from our Russian friends whenever we talk about Afghanistan. Um, but they want stability there. Everybody, there's, there's a consensus that a stable Afghanistan will help stabilize a whole region that badly needs stability. Uh, and as I've said on several occasions, I think the US and NATO presence there helps to provide an element of stability, which will be sorely missed if we have a rush to evacuate, uh, which I fear that the Trump administration will do in a desperate effort to try to find votes to win in November. Thank you so much. That's been a fascinating discussion. Of course, as, as Brits, those of us who are Brits on this call should know perfectly well from anybody who studies history, we have had very unfortunate uh, wars that drew us into and then defeated us in Afghanistan in the past. And as has often been said, not enough people read history, because if they did, we would see here yeah, playing out again a certain element of the great game. The, the players who are at work here on this 
this this part of the world. And um, Bruce, your your insights and your unique perspective is both heartening because it informs us, and also deeply depressing because I don't see a speedy way out, and uh, nor, nor do many others. But thank you, everybody, for your significant contributions. And, and Bruce, thank you. I just wanted to mention before we close, um, there are two events coming up in short order. In 48 hours time on the 18th of June, we have a session on Vietnam led by the Vietnamese ambassador to the UK, talking about with a team with him, not only how they dealt with COVID-19, but how perhaps people don't necessarily know this, Vietnam is one of the fastest growing second level uh, economies in the world, which is interesting. And then on the 23rd of June, we have two members of the Legislative Assembly in Hong Kong, two young members who will be talking about how they see Hong Kong and we will be adding other people to those panels. And I'm very grateful, Doug, to you for having helped to arrange these things and to all of you for participating. And once again, Bruce, thank you for joining us and thank you very much for uh, what you have said to us and the thought process you've led us all through. Much appreciated. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.